Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Holistic Nutritionist podcast. My name is Natalie Douglas, and today we have another incredible interview with another very intelligent and experienced clinician. And today it is Moira Bradfield who is joining us, who, for those of you who don't know, is the founder of Intimate Ecology Clinical and Education Services. She is a naturopath, acupuncturist, and educator with over 19 years clinical experience experience. She has a passion for helping people experience optimal health in sustainable and sensible ways. Clinically, she has a niche interest in recurrent vaginal infections, optimal vaginal and genitourinary health, hormones, and the vaginal microbiome, which is the bacteria and the microbes that actually reside in the vaginal cavity. Moira holds a Bachelor of Naturopathy from Southern Cross University, a master's degree in acupuncture from Southern Cross University, and is a PhD candidate at Griffith University, Australia. Her clinical trial is focusing on an intervention to reduce the incidence of recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. And in addition to her role as a naturopath in private clinical practice, Moira has also lectured in naturopathy, biosciences, and nutrition both overseas and in Australia. And in the show notes, you'll be able to find all of the links of how you can actually find Moira, work with her, sign up to the clinical trial that is running and recruiting at the moment, and all of the amazing information and offerings that she has available. Let's jump in to this very interesting chat and hear from Moira about vaginal health. Welcome to the Holistic Nutritionist podcast. It is so lovely to have you here and such an honor actually, because I think that you're someone who knows a hell of a lot about the vagina. And I think that, you know, it's something that we don't talk about enough. And it's funny how much there is to know about it when you actually start looking into all the things that can possibly go wrong and right. So I'm glad we've got you on the podcast to start to kind of unpack some of those things that perhaps aren't talked about enough. But before we jump into all of that, I love, well, I would love to know what is something that is exciting you in the area of natural medicine at the moment? Gosh, I thought about this question and there's quite a a few things, but in the area that I'm in, obviously I'm thinking quite closely about microbes and bacterias and funguses. And I really like how, you know, in, in what we do in natural medicine, obviously there's some really traditional things, but we're very good at incorporating new research and new science. And we've now got the ability as well to sort of go out and look more closely at those microbiomes or those bacteria and microbes. And that really excites me because it adds a whole new dimension into how we support people as they go through their health issues. Mm, Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? And just to point out there for people listening, it's not, we don't just have a gut microbiome. And I think that's sometimes what the assumption is. Do you find that if you're speaking to clients that when you say the word microbiome, it's just like, oh yeah, my gut. Whereas there are many other microbiomes and I guess today very much talking about, you know, the, the genital microbiome or the vaginal microbiome in particular. So I get the first question that comes up, you know, for me when we're talking about this is really around thrush because I feel like that is probably one of the most common, commonly like experienced or talked about terms that, that comes up. But what exactly is thrush and there, are there other names for it that people need to be aware of? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the first thing I think about thrush is it's... um not actually the most common vaginal complaint that you can experience. And and I think that's a really important thing to know because not mm-hmm. everything with a vaginal discharge is what we would commonly call thrush or a yeast infection or candidiasis or vulvovaginal candidiasis or vaginitis even. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's lots of different things that could be going on that cause a discharge or a change to how you normally would feel around your vulva or your vagina. And um, so the the definition of thrush in that context is a fungal infection of the vagina and the vulva. 
and so commonly called thrush and um, that can be for a variety of different reasons but essentially it's fungal not bacterial and we need to sort of keep that in mind because a lot of the time the most common issues are bacterial in nature. Yeah that's interesting and I'm glad you pointed that out because I mean I whenever I'm questioning clients about vaginal health generally just as a broad screening type of tool most of the time the only issue that they're aware of whenever there's any change in how their vagina feels how their vulva feels is thrush is straight to thrush as opposed to there being any other possibility so I'm really glad we started there to clear that up so you you know you mentioned there that it's not caused by bacteria, which brings up for me bacterial vaginosis and the difference between thrush and and BV, let's refer to it as, so we don't have to keep saying the whole long word. So how would, like, what are the differences there between the two? I mean, the the main differences is how they present. Obviously, they're caused by different microbes. And Thrush is that very typical white or chunky or what's referred to as a cottage cheese discharge. It has quite a lot of itch and inflammation and redness associated with it, so lots of irritation. And bacterial vaginosis, which is driven by really specific bacteria, has a discharge that is very different to that. It's quite watery. It can be milky to grey in colour. And it's the one that has that characteristic fishy smell that, you know, has this obviously social stigma around it. Mm -hmm. Um, So in terms of how they present, they're very different in that acute or, you know, sort of like a once-off episode. Um, And, you know, I think that's important because, as I was saying, you know, lots of people, and I have this experience in clinic, is people will come to me and say, yes, I used to get a lot of thrush, but as we delve into the characteristics of their discharge, it doesn't really look like thrush. Um, And it probably wasn't thrush that they were getting for all of those years. It would be more likely to be a bacterial imbalance within that area. Mm. And how do... Like, how do you actually determine which one it is outside of just clinical symptoms as someone's describing what the discharge might feel like or look like? Are there specific tests that are different when you're trying to find, um, you know, thrush or versus BV? Yeah, I mean, the testing that we have through just going to your standard doctor in terms of it's called a genital swab microscopy and culture. Um, so they essentially, they take a swab, they look at it under a microscope, they might add some different chemicals like potassium hydroxide, and they swipe it out onto a culture medium and grow it to see what grows. The same swab can tell us whether there's a fungus there or whether there's a bacteria there, and also what levels of beneficial microbes in this area what they might be or whether they've disappeared. Um, And so it is a really important step for people that are having a lot of these symptoms if they haven't had a swab to have a swab because it will tell you quite definitively which issue is the one that you have. And and certainly there are circumstances where we, you know, a once-off thrush episode because you've had an antibiotic or, you know, those type of things are quite straightforward and can be treated over the counter without needing to go down the pathway of having a swab. But if it's something that's happening frequently, it really needs to be looked at in that way. So it's quite standard through your medical provider or your GP. Um, For me as a clinician, obviously I'm not a GP, I'm a naturopath. and, And there's a lot of questioning that I have for people around those symptoms. There's also things that you can do so um, the vagina itself and the fluids that are in it can have or sit at a really specific pH range and it's quite an acidic environment. That's how it is able to interact with the outside world and still stay quite healthy. Um, So if we see the pH shifting above 4.5 and moving towards being more basic or more alkaline, so going up into the higher numbers, then we know that that's usually a bacterial infection or there's some sort of bacterial shift going on with it. Whereas in recurrent thrush, the thrush that's happening a lot of the time, that pH can be quite stable and you can still have the issue of the discharge. So there's lots of different patterns that we look at when we're treating it holistically, um, but we do need to really do those basic foundational tests as well through just standard medical testing. 
Mm. And does it matter whether the swab that's done is a high vaginal swab or not? Like, is that something people need to be specifying or is it assumed that that's what will be done or is, does it not matter? It doesn't necessarily matter. So the microbes that live within the vagina, uh, there are slight differences when you go from one zone to the next, so up towards the cervix and then down towards the opening that is to the outside world, which is called the introitus. Um, There there are slight differences, but when you've got infection, a low vaginal swab is fine. Um, There's a lot of evidence to suggest that people self-sampling is adequate. And in fact, a lot of STI clinics um, or sexual health clinics now use that. So people self-swab themselves um, and, th- and that does give you enough information as long as you're getting discharge to have a look at. Mm, interesting and what about the pH testing is that something that people can do like at home or is it something where it's included as part of the swab that's done um, at through the GP? Yeah, so pH testing isn't part of the standard testing at the GP. Um, Sometimes when it goes to the lab, they may run a pH, but pH testing is a very simple thing that when people have a lot of issues in this area, they are able to do at home and keep a track because I know I certainly send my um, clients home with pH strips so I get them to order their own and we can test every day to see what the changes might be at different points in a menstrual cycle or in response to different activities and it gives us a lot of data to understand what could be challenging that environment or triggering a symptom Um, and pH test strips are are inexpensive they just need to cover the right range to be able to pick up changes so they need to be um, able to cover a quite a low range in terms of acidity so when we look at the pH in the vagina in health it's considered to be between 3.6 and 4.5 so you need to be able to pick up anything really from 3.6 to above 4.5 because once you get above 4.5 as I said you're looking at bacterial infections like BV or aerobic vaginitis um, or you know sometimes we see these things as well when estrogen drops off towards menopause so you need to just be able to track that and you will see it change over a month slightly and sometimes around ovulation for example the ovulatory discharge is more basic or more alkaline so but that's quite normal because it's quite receptive then to sperm and to conception obviously Mm, aren't we so fascinating I just think where the body is just so intelligent and the more I learn about it especially in relation to just how our bodies change throughout our menstrual cycle I just think it's just incredible and um, something that's really empowering to know as well and I really like the idea of people being able to keep track of this kind of information because I'm you know I'm sure you're the same as a clinician the more information a patient or a client has when they come to see you and the more insight they have into just observing their body over time the easier it is to actually help identify what might be the problem that's um, occurring or the imbalance that's occurring. So I love that. I love that. So the next question, I guess, that that brings up is, in your experience, what are the main kind of driving factors behind recurrent thrush? Um, Let's start there and then maybe we'll talk about recurrent BV. So Mm -hmm. starting with thrush, what do you see as being the main driving factors when that is constantly coming up as opposed to just a one-off incident? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because recurrent thrush or what they call uh, VVC or recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis is actually broken into two different types. And um, there's what they call idiopathic, which means there's not actually any known pathology or health reason why someone may have recurrent thrush, which is the majority of what I see in clinical practice, like seemingly healthy younger people who have a thrush that will come on a lot of the time monthly and quite relentlessly. Um, And so if we're looking at idiopathic versus what they call secondary, which is as a response to something, um, the idiopathic, there is some theory. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns in terms of the medical science behind it, but there is a theory that there is um, an allergic component. So They know that people who have allergic tendencies, things like allergic rhinitis or hay fever, can have a higher amount of recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. And they also know when they look at their um, microbiomes on a fungal level, so they're looking at the fungus that that normally 
exist within the vagina, that that can be a little bit disordered in people that have allergic tendencies. And so they think that the immune system is reacting to a low or normal carriage of candida. So just just being overreactive, just like you would with a pollen in the air. Um, There's also theories around hormonal drivers. So uh, they know that like the middle of teal, so you know, around about day 21 of the menstrual cycle for people that have that 28-day cycle, that that's a very high risk point for thrush for a lot of people. And and it's because of, they think, it's because of there's a few changes that go on with the immune system because of the changes to hormones, but also the relationship of progesterone to estrogen at that key point. And then in idiopathic, there's also uh, a lot of work going on looking at genetics as well. So genetics of both the microbe, but also the human who hosts it. Um, And they see that there are some differences in that. And there's a whole lot of different genes involved, everything from estrogen metabolism, obviously, um, to looking at how we actually deal with key um, immune factors and how what the immune response is. So recurrent or RVVC for an idiopathic or for the unknown reason is quite complex because there's it's not as simple as going, oh, just fix that sugar issue, which or you know, it's because you took antibiotics. It's it's often, you know, trying to find a needle in a haystick in, in, in terms of finding a cause for somebody. Um, the secondary forms, you know, are more common when people have immune compromise, if they've got some other disease state going on, or if there is blood glucose issues in terms of diabetes. Um, you can also see recurrent issues when there is there are different types of candida and um, some of those are not responsive to standard therapy. And so it may have just set up home and it's never been targeted properly. And you know, we also see increased risk around pregnancy. There's increased risk of people that are using HRT or estrogen-based um, hormone therapy. So there's all of these things we have to tease out. And then there's all this lifestyle stuff you know, yeah. <laughs> underneath it. And, um, you know, obviously people report that sex is a, a sim- or a, will cause symptoms for them. And with thrush, it's interesting because we do know microbes in general can be passed between people. We can share um, components of our microbiome in many different ways, even just by living with someone, we share microbes. But by engaging in sexual interaction, we do share microbes, although they've found with candida or with thrush that treating partners doesn't necessarily lead to resolution in recurrent thrush. But addressing addressing things like friction and um, tissue trauma in terms of what happens in the act of sex does reduce incidence. Um, so there's it's sort of a complex soup of many things going on and then hygiene practices and things like that as well. So most people, when I see them, have already changed their underwear fabric and have looked at all of the things in their home that they might be doing and stopped washing with that soap and, you know, but they still have these symptoms. So it's, it's there's a lot in that that you need to look through. Yeah, there definitely is. And I think it's... Yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of the time you're seeing the really complex cases where, they, as you've said, they've done a lot of the basic, you know, don't get thrush 101 of to have, mm. don't wear your sweaty underwear and shower after you exercise and all of that kind of stuff. In in terms of natural treatments available for people when it comes to, let's just stick with thrush for the moment here, is there anything that, say, at the first sign of thrush or some kind of irritation that is looking like it's it's thrush is there anything that people can do that is not likely to cause harm or is it one of those things where as soon as there is any change you're better off going straight to the gp to actually find out specifically what it is um yeah it's a really tricky question because it does if we're dealing with acute thrush um, you know, there's soothing things. Like, I mean, there is evidence for dairy products inserted, so lac- um, yogurt and things like that, that will improve lactobacilli, micro- um, the microbes within there, which are a big part of maintaining that pH within the system. But that's mm-hmm. in an acute situation. In a recurrent one, there's often very few things that provide relief acutely um, other than over-the-counter therapies. I mean, and then... And then there are, sorry, over-the-counter pharmaceuticals. And then there are a, a, an array of 
natural approaches, but it's sort of, um, I mean, the way I work clinically, that it's having all of those set up and ready to go. They should already be kicking along in the background. I mean, you need to think about, obviously, things you can access and you can use in a preventative sense, which would be good quality lubricants if you're having sex. And if sex is your trigger, make sure your condom, if you're using a barrier method, isn't contributing to the issue because you might have a, a casein allergy or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. And you can obviously address your diet and make sure it is beautiful and whole food based and not extreme in any way or um, that you are, you know, having a good digestive function obviously as well because sometimes we do trend or move microbes from our bowel into uh, our vagina or into our urethra. Um, but it is a tricky, I thought about this question. I was like, I can't, I mean, a lot of the products that I recommend are not over the counter things. Um, I do recommend a lot of my clients will do things like, you know, regularly consume apple cider vinegar, for example, which contains oh. acetic acid, which has a really interesting action against um, candida species in that it can induce cell death for those candida yeasts um, and it can actually uh, optimise fluconazole function if you are going with an over-the-counter pharmaceutical medicine um, it's it has a really beautiful balancing act on the digestive microbiome as well and sometimes you know people will find relief if they use a dilute bath and sit in it um, so there's all of these sort of things but working in for me working in a recurrent infection space it's more about prevention how can we stop that next episode occurring mm. and, and- Yeah, absolutely. And in that kind of in your toolkit in relation to that, like, obviously not not being prescriptive, anyone listening, but just in terms of what your toolkit looks like across the board in relation to addressing this, like from a preventative perspective, Mm -hmm. what are some examples of some of the nutrients or herbs or um, topical things or insertions or probiotics or anything like that, that you find yourself commonly prescribing and uh, as I said before anyone listening this is obviously something that you would want the guidance of a practitioner around but I'm just curious to know what are some of the things in in that toolkit yeah I mean most of the time I would have people on an oral lactobacilli rich probiotic and there's some really beautiful ones on the market that are specific for vaginal health Um, they are I mean, again, because recurrent and acute thrush are very different. If it was an acute situation, I would say, you know, hit that really hard and do (laughs) in the very early stages. In a recurrent thrush, it's more about background, just making sure that microbiome is balanced. So um, an oral probiotic that is lactobacilli rich would be a, a primary thing. I do find that because of the fact that a lot of these people have had really recurrent symptoms um, on a tissue in terms of the vulva and the vagina tissue level that I really want to make sure that that is um, has the best integrity possible so I will use a lot of things like sea buckthorn oil which has and this is oral um, has a lot of evidence in terms of the vaginal mucosa or the tissue integrity in the mucosa in a really specific subset of people which is menopausal people but I do find that clinically it's a really great thing to have in the background for most of my vaginal health clients because if you have less tissue trauma or if you have a vaginal uh, tissue that is more likely to not damage easily then you're actually minimizing the environment that those microbes are opportunistic in Mm. Um, so looking at sort of that in the background and then you know the finer details for me come into uh, I do want to deal with this allergic issue for people and there's obviously um, products on the market that do that Um, for me I use a lot of um, what they call bical skull cap uh, which has a really traditional use in candida but also has a lot of evidence in terms of how it Um, modulates inflammatory chemicals within that area. So I find that that's a really successful thing. Um, And then sort of usually some background, quite specific antifungal herbs, but not in extreme amounts. What we've learned about microbes in this space is that eradication is not necessarily the answer. And if you only take a killing approach, then all you do is kill and then something else will take its space. So while I use antimicrobials, I don't use things that are going to wipe out everything bacterial and fungal. So I like a little bit of horopedo in the background, um, but I wouldn't go down the path of really strong antimicrobials like um, 
oregano oil, for example, which a lot of people will use, only because I find it sort of damages the digestive microbiome and then you're having to mop up that as well. Mm. So it's sort of quite complex in that area. But there, you know, and then I will individualise, you know, this person has a nervous system tendency and we want to support that. So there's, you know, you've got to really approach it from multiple angles and hormones obviously clearing, making sure hormones are supported as well. Yeah, it's it's so, so true. And I, I love that you pointed out that, balancing or looking after the terrain so to speak um, side of things because I very much think that from a gut perspective as well where I well maybe it's just the circles I'm traveling in but we're moving more towards understanding as you said that it's not about just killing everything and then assuming that you can just start over you know with a probiotic and then you're good to go it really is about how do we create an environment that is conducive to the good guys, so to speak, staying in good numbers and keeping anything that is potentially problematic at bay. I think that it's it sounds like, you know, that vaginal environment is very similar in terms of just trying to keep it balanced in the way that it's supposed to, which is obviously different to the gut, but the same kind of concept. Mm. What are your thoughts on then things like, um, douching and um, using s- certain things to clean the vagina with. I think there's a lot of confusing and conflicting information out there in relation to that, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that anything that we use in that way needs to be used in moderation. And clinically, I will use what I call low-volume irrigation. So we're talking about 20 mil within the vagina, So whereas douches traditionally are much much larger volumes and that will go in and flush out everything that's in there and because I'm looking along those same lines I sort of want to maintain this environment not damage it further because a lot of the time I'm seeing people that have already been on quite extended protocols of pharmaceuticals and and you know that in itself causes this issue of maybe loss of protective microbes so if i'm douching or recommending irrigations for people they're only used what i call pulse treat so we we pick the time that is the highest risk for that individual which has been determined by talking to them um, and then we almost proactively will do an irrigation at that risk point so that they don't go into that disordered state of microbes um mm-hmm. So when we use them like that, and as long as they are suitable for the environment as well, there's obviously a lot of different things you can put into a douche. And some of those are not conducive to vaginal health in terms of if it's too alkalizing or if it's going to damage cells, um, you know, those type of things I would say no. Uh, and But low volume irrigations that are supportive of the environment that maybe contain prebiotic fluids or that have I mean sometimes they will use dilutions of apple cider vinegar in this way as well um, that are are looking at that fungal microbiome Mm. those type of things are okay but what we do know about douches um, is that there's certainly evidence in terms of research that shows us that you know different irrigations and different douches can have a benefit in reducing microbes but they also have risk with them as well and that's what we need to think about because you know using douches over long periods of time has a risk of pelvic inflammatory disease associated with it Um, and often that comes or is driven by bacterial imbalance So it is really about considering how you feel after that. What happens if you stop that douche? Does everything get worse? Mm -hmm. Are you suddenly experiencing bacterial infections when you once had fungal infections? Um, Does that thing burn or hurt? So those type of things are, you know, things that I would say work with somebody who has experience with um, working in that area. But you can do other things like sit in sits baths for example with which might have things like green tea or apple cider vinegar in them and that's less invasive in that it's not going into the vaginal canal where those really specific microbiome populations are of funguses and bacteria but it's working on the external surface where there might be inflammation because the vulva itself is slightly different in terms of microbes itself it's part of more of an external skin microbiome so it has a slightly different composition but you can provide symptomatic relief from burning and irritation by using a sitz bath yeah that's really interesting and when you say prebiotics do you use much like are you referring to like lactulose is that something that you use um 
as as a preventative in some people? Yeah, definitely. Lactulose has been shown to improve the area and not increase the risk of thrush. I think it's important as well that when we're talking about recurrent thrush, as I mentioned, that this is a fungal issue. It's not a bacterial issue. And, and often they've found the bacterial microbiome in recurrent thrush is quite normal. Um, so we're trying to work with perhaps things that we don't have a lot of knowledge of at this point in history because it's only quite recently that we've started to sample the fungal microbiome in ways that we have been doing for a little while with bacteria. So the knowledge base around what constitutes a normal fungal microbiome in any area, not just the vagina, is very limited at the moment. Um, but we have we do have obviously evidence that shows us that this helped or this didn't help, and so we can sort of make some assumptions about what could be going on there. But lactulose is a lactobacilli prebiotic, but it does have some evidence in in helping provide relief in thrush um, when it's inserted in the vagina and also when we take it um, orally as well because we're affecting the gut microbiome that has a flow-on effect to the other microbiome sites as well. It's like we're all connected. (laughs) (laughs) So we've talked a little bit about thrush there and thank you for sharing those insights. Moving on to BV, so in terms of what the main driving factors behind recurrent BV are. is Does it differ to thrush or are they similar drivers? Oh, they're similar, I guess, but in different ways. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. So, and, and often, unfortunately, we see the two come together in that sometimes people start off with BV, they get the antibiotic treatment, it triggers a thrush episode, and then they're in this loop of BV at the start of the month and thrush at the end of the month. Um, mm-hmm goes on and on and on but with recurrent bv there's a few different things so um obviously well not obviously but bv is a, a shift to the bacterial microbiome so it's what they call a dysbiosis we tend to see a decrease in lactobacilli bacteria and an increase in what they call anaerobic bacteria or bacteria that are associated with bv so traditionally one called gardnerella but there's a whole range of different microbes that can all be existing together or maybe the problem in this issue and so the microbe itself is a big factor in recurrent bv because some are more resistant to standard treatments as well there's one called adipobium which is a really tricky one and it's often associated with recurrent bv We know with BV as well on a hormonal level that it is more likely to occur in people or in points of the menstrual cycle when estrogen is low, whereas that thrush is more when there's an estrogen relationship issue or there's higher amounts of estrogen. And so estrogen is a really important hormone for so many reasons, but in the vaginal space, it is what supplies the fuel for the lactobacilli bacteria so that they can set up house and multiply and do their housekeeping, which is the regulation of pH. And when we have low estrogen levels, we have less fuel for lactobacilli or we may see low amounts of lactobacilli. And so when that shifts, we see obviously that other microbes can take over like in bacterial vaginosis. And so hormonal lows or states of lows are a big factor in recurrent BV. So it could be anything from breastfeeding. It could be in menopause. It may be because somebody's had some a range of other types of pharmaceuticals that have impacted that those levels or those beneficial microbes in the area. Um, and so we need to sort of address that and have a look at that as well. And a lot of the time, with recurrent BV, I see, you know, that people have had acute episodes and they've been treated quite successfully, but there's not necessarily been anything to change the circumstances of why they got that infection in the first place or to re-establish good colonies within the um, vagina. And so those are challenges to that we need to look at as well. And they include things like sexual intercourse because we do share microbes back and forth. And with BV, we know that you can actually share the microbes associated with BV back and forth. So it's not an STI, but it's called a sexually enhanced disorder, meaning that the microbes that cause BV can be shared through sex, but you can get it in other ways as well. It doesn't have to be through sex. Um, And 
So partners, whether they're male or female, could be sharing those microbes back and forth and everything else that goes with the act of sex as well. So the lubricants I mentioned before, saliva, um, ejaculation, these are all challenges to the pH of the vagina. And if you shift the pH and the body can't recover the pH, then it gives an opportunity as well for these microbes to sort of come up. Um, and I guess at that final point in terms of pH then is also menstruation itself. So for me in clinic, I see a lot of people will have BV flares if they're a recurrent BV sufferer just after they finish their period or just before they're about to start their period. And sometimes their period will give them relief, but the menstrual fluid itself is much more alkaline and it is a, a time when uh, the microbes associated with BV may actually grow. And so right after their period, when estrogen is still low, you know, they may be given the opportunity to just sort of grow up and, and take over a little bit and then would get that characteristic smell. And it's interesting because as hormones ebb and flow over a cycle, the microbiome will change as well. So that smell may be there in the beginning, but it may actually resolve itself without needing to go and treat it. Um, and that's a big factor in recurrent BV as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, so much to it. Hey, and I think... It is it important then, I guess, when someone is having recurrent BV, especially um, highlighting that it can be something that's transported or passed back and forth, that the male partner as well is assessed to see whether that is the source of, you know, recurrence? Well, frustratingly, they don't test male partners for that. Um, so female partners, definitely, I would be getting them swabbed and a lot of the time I will treat uh, female partners at the same time um, but in terms of male swabbing because the penis has a, a microbiome obviously there's a microbiome of the semen there's a microbiome of the penis skin itself around the coronary sulcus is different to the the shaft for example um, but that is a very different microbiome to the vagina so it's more common to see those types of microbes there and so it's not something that you could swab and show that it was an issue with standard testing mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and some of these microbes that exist there have, are more pathogenic. So you can have a really pathogenic strain of Gardnerella, for example, or you could have one that's not very good at causing infections. And so we're not quite there with testing. There are researchers in Australia who are looking at couples and and testing both of their microbiomes and looking what happens with sex and looking to see how long it takes to recover and what happens in recurrent BV, which is amazing. But medically, there's nothing that can really be tested. If you send somebody um, to their GP, they're not going to diagnose BV in a male because it is specific to the vagina. Yeah, yes, that makes sense. Frustratingly, but makes sense. <laughs> so in terms of just back on like barrier protection and using condoms, and mm -hmm. is there any effect that spermicide has on the vaginal microbiome? And is, there, is that something that people should be looking for when they're looking at barrier prote protection in terms of condoms that don't contain that? Or what's the kind of recommendations around there? Um, so there's a few things, I guess, if you're looking at barrier methods that you need to consider, if you're in a country that has spermicides, so in Australia, we don't have spermicides, so it's not something I've done a lot of reading into. Um, but the definitely that can impact the microbiome because there's lots of considerations. It's not just about the spermicidal action itself, which infers that it's got some sort of damage, to, um, ability to damage a cell, mm. um, but also about the things like the pH of that ingredient or the osmolarity which is the movement of water in and out of cells so with a lubricant for example which it also comes on condoms or you would use or you may use with a barrier method um you know the ph and the osmolarity may mean that if it's not right that you're damaging cells or you're busting them open or causing them to swell or to shrivel just because the lubricant isn't matched to the environment mm -hmm. and then we have condoms obviously and, and other barrier methods like dams um, and what they're made out of may make a difference as well so I tend to counsel people on you know questioning around allergies and, and sensitivities and things like that but I tend to recommend people if they're looking for a condom that they choose what they call a vegan condom which means they don't have casein in them um, because casein as we know as a dairy protein has a lot of people that are sensitive to it and they're often 
well, it is often found in latex condoms. Um, and then, you know, looking at what you're utilising that with, obviously, in terms of the lubricant. And then when we're looking at vaginal dams for females, um, they're not as readily available. So sometimes, you know, if you're looking at introducing a barrier method, which I will often do while I'm working to restore the environment, it doesn't mean you have to have protected sex forever. It means that we're trying to buy time to maintain balance while we do all the work so that you can have a normal, um, you know, balanced vagina happily ever after. Mm. Um, but when you're looking for vaginal dams, they're really hard to access and that's a huge barrier in itself as well that people are often not engaging in, in protected sex because of the accessibilities of them. But you don't get as much choice in, in what they're made of, although there are vegan ones available. Yeah, that's that's really good to know. And I think in terms of lubricants, what's your favourite natural lubricant? Yeah, I tend to um, recommend a lot of the lubricant called Yes uh-huh. which, um, because it is pH correct and it's osmolar correct. When we look at uh, what those parameters are, the World Health Organisation puts out a recommendation and a huge amount of the ones on the market don't meet it. Um, So companies are getting a little bit more on board with it now um, and are working within those confines. But YES has been doing it for quite a while and their technology is quite good behind their lubricant production. Um, There's a beautiful one in the UK called um, Into the Wild, which is lovely. Uh, Many people would be familiar with Silk. That's quite a a neutral one as well. And all of these are water-based lubricants because when we look at oil-based ones, that's not compatible with a barrier method. So you need to have a think about that as well. So a lubricant should be matched not just to those parameters but to the type of sex that you're having. And if you are using a barrier, it needs to be compatible with that um, because obviously there are really specific things that we're trying to achieve with when we have sex and who we have sex with and how we have sex Um, and everything sort of needs to be matched. There's a little bit of a science behind that. Yeah, who would have thought? There's a a science to everything. That's that's really interesting and thank you for sharing that information because I think it's really good to have practical places to source some of the things they're recommending as well. I want to shift gears very slightly and ask about the influence of the vaginal microbiome on fertility. And obviously asking someone who works in this area, that question is such a loaded question. So I apologize (laughs) for being like, hey, do you have three hours? But maybe just in a very broad sense, does your vaginal microbiome have an impact on fertility? And is there anything in particular that would be a good thing to check in on or have checked before you're actively trying to conceive? So the answer to that is yes. So, um, and then we'll leave it there, no. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and thank you for having me. Um, so we know from, I mean, obviously a lot of people are looking into research in this area. It's a really important part of human existence that we maintain fertility in our population. And there are definitely patterns of vaginal microbes that are associated with conception. And there are unfortunately also patterns associated with loss and So looking at that balance, and again, it's everything I've talked about already in terms of pH balance and having something that's lactobacilli dominated, that's all supportive of conception. When we have tendencies to bacterial vaginosis, particularly, so bacterial imbalance um, or aerobic vaginitis, which is things like strep B or E. coli infections, they're all associated, unfortunately, with a higher risk of loss if you do fall pregnant or um, possibly getting in the way of fertility, both assisted and natural. So, you know, in the assisted fertility world, there's a really big focus on the vaginal microbiome because they're wanting the best outcomes. And they have found that, you know, from when they've done um, embryo transfers, that when the catheter tip comes out and they test it after, that if it had a lactobacilli dominance in that vagina, then it's more likely to be associated with a a positive pregnancy um, and one that goes through to full term. Mm. This is one that doesn't. So my tips around that is that you should be treating vaginal health as part of preconception. 
that for all the other reasons where you sort out your hormones and make sure your eggs are perfect and that your partner's got great semen, um, that you need to be thinking about what your vaginal health history is. And for me, that means talking to people about, you know, have you had bacterial vag vagin um, vaginosis? Is there a history of chlamydia there that I need to be aware of? What happened when you treated that? Um, have you, you know, when was the last time you had a UTI, for example, because that's very much linked into the vaginal microbiome and the relationship between the bladder and the vagina because the bladder has a microbiome as well. Um, and those things can give us some clues that maybe vaginal health needs to be optimised. And so you're better off spending the time in that preconception phase, getting it right so that you can optimise your outcomes. Um, and it also means that, you know, in terms of healthy pregnancy, they know that that type of balanced microbiome is more likely to have less issues with premature rupture of membranes or to have any sort of neonatal, neonatal sepsis or you decrease your risk of strep B infection, which means an antibiotic intervention for a lot of people in their labour. So it's a big area and a really important one that we need to be talking about and asking about. And when you, you know, if you find yourself in a fertility journey and you're at you know, working with a fertility specialist because you've gotten to that point and haven't been successful or you've had some loss, then they often go down that, you know, they retest, they do high vaginal swabs, they look at microbes that maybe you haven't been tested for before. Um, and that's because of the many ways it can impact uh, fertility and conception. Yeah, and that's, you know, such a good thing for people to be aware of because I think it can be a very confronting and overwhelming world when it comes to infertility or even just being pro planning for trying to conceive. And it's just good to know these different areas that can have influence and that it's not all just this one particular focus that we are. There are many places in the body where we can have an influence on improving fertility or just being aware of it. The question that I have for you, which I know will come up as a question if I don't ask it, yeah. is if someone, well, two questions, if someone is looking at assessing generally their vaginal microbiome preconception, like preconception as just part of not necessarily that they're currently going through IVF or they're needing to or there are any big signs of infertility but just trying to be proactive about it, mm -hmm. is getting a vaginal swab through the GP in Australia generally enough or are there, you know, how we can get gut testing in Australia through practitioners that's much more comprehensive? Does that exist for the vaginal microbiome as well? Yeah, it does. So, I mean, I would always start with a swab and I work a lot with swabs in clinical practice because there is lots of functional information there that's not reported on. Um, so that's always my first step. And then depending upon the history of the individual, for some people, we will push through to do microbiome profiling. It's not as prevalent as the gut stuff and um, in different countries there's different panels available in Australia at the moment outside of research there's not a panel available but we can um, tap into other countries like the UK or the US um, and there's some in Europe as well and there's a beautiful French one that we can actually look at and, and these panels are uh, looking at really key um, lactobacillus species that are important for vaginal health. They look at you know, key species that are a prob problem in terms of bacterial vaginosis or uh, lots of the, when we've talked about candida, we haven't talked about the species, but there are different species that can be associated with candida. So they generally sample lots of those. Um, they also look at some really obscure microbes, which are called molecutes. So there's one called mycoplasma and there's another called urea plasma, which often in Australia, if you're having fertility issues or if you've had some loss, they will go down a path of testing as well. Um, and some of these panels also give us some information on inflammation by looking at inflammatory markers. So they're definitely out there and available, but they are important to consider in the context of the time of month that you had it sampled and, and what symptoms did you have when you had it sampled because the microbiome is probably a little bit more stable than the gut, but it's dynamic because it will change over the course of a month depending on where your hormones are and what you would be expecting to find at that point. So it does take a bit of background knowledge to understand what your results mean. Yeah, that's really interesting. And is there a particular time of month that you tell people to, to test if they are going to do just a screening 
type um, test, is there a particular time of the month that is better to test at or is it just simply knowing where you were at in your cycle to help interpreting to help interpret the results it's a bit of both i mean if i was working with someone and there wasn't a significant health history in terms of the vagina or the urinary system and there wasn't symptoms that were coming on a monthly basis and we couldn't pinpoint where that is then and if we were just looking at conception and making sure everything was good i would probably try sampling around ovulation if I knew that they had a risk period for symptoms, whether they be BV or thrush. You want to test around those because I've seen some tests where people haven't done that and it doesn't tell me anything because at that point their microbiome was doing okay. A lactobacilli had recovered and there may be some low levels of those other bacteria, but that's completely normal as well. I mean, it's a, it's a soup of bacteria and they all exist harmoniously if the lactobacillus is doing its job. So you want to capture it at a point where there is increased risk or there is symptoms or there's a specific circumstance like ovulation and conception that you're trying to have a look at as well. Mm, how interesting. I hope we get a, a test that's available in, available in Australia here soon. I hear you, you know, we can still draw on other countries, but it would be great if we can get one in Australia. I believe it's on its way. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Very exciting. So thank you so much for sharing all of that information with us. Before we wrap up, where can people find out more about you and your work? Are you practicing still at the moment? Tell us a little bit more about how people can get in contact with you. Yeah, I do still have a clinical practice. It's not a full-time practice because I'm meant to be a full-time PhD student. Um, so you can go and have a look at my website, which is intimateecology.com.au, and that's my clinic site, but it also has some links to some education and um, just general health information. And you can also, I think, believe in the course, in the podcast notes, uh, I mentioned I'm a PhD student, so I'm doing a trial on recurrent thrush and we're looking for people who are transitioning off standard fluconazole therapy or antifungal therapy, which for recurrent thrush is often used for six months or more. Um, and so there's a clinical trial that I'm recruiting for, which would be wonderful if you think that you're eligible, that you could click on the link um, and have a look at that, which is through Griffith University on the Gold Coast. So both of those areas. I'm also on Instagram as Intimate Ecology and Facebook as Intimate Ecology as well, where I post up information about the vaginal microbiome and different health issues. Yes, somewhere I've learned lots about the vaginal microbiome. So thank you. And I'll make sure that all of that is in the show notes and um, so people can jump on over and have a look at anything that they need to or are interested in. And thank you again so much for joining us. I know that everyone is probably, uh, their brains are probably exploding, but I also think it's just a topic that needs more airtime. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.